骨髓嘅口感同埋味道到底系点噶？Hi everyone. I think I'm going to start first while we're um, welcoming more people to come into our meeting today. Um, so good morning to our audience joining from Hong Kong and Asia, and good evening to many friends on the West Coast in America and also many other places in the world. Uh, welcome to the panel discussion, Wesley Thompson, Home and Away. My name is Anchi Lee. I'm a PhD student at American Studies at the University of Hong Kong. Today's program is organized by the School of Modern Languages and Cultures of Hong Kong University in partnership with the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive in California. I'd also like to thank Gallery Dumont for your uh, very generous support for the program today. So today's program is organized to celebrate the art of Wesley Townsend on the occasion of his exhibition, Spiritual Mountains, which is currently on view at Banff Museum till June 12th. Wesley Townsend was a Hong Kong artist who dedicated his career to exploring ink painting. His work draws heavily on traditional Chinese painting techniques and also processes, including painting with his fingers and also hands, but takes steps uh, further to create a personal expression that is wholly his own. This exhibition debuts a recent gift to Banffa Museum of 11 paintings by the artist, with historical paintings from the museum's extensive Chinese painting collection to demonstrate the relationship between his genius and also that of uh, the past masters. This exhibition is organized by now retired Miss Julia White, Benfa's former senior curator of Asian art, with the support of associate curator Stephanie Canizo Ken and also independent curator Rosalind Q. Uh, the exhibition is supported in part of the Asian Art Endowment of Fund and also Wesley Townsend um, Charity Charitable Trust. So our program today is a mini symposium on Wesley Townsend. We will start with two academic presentations by Dr. Rosan Q and also Dr. Ross Hammers in the first hour. And then we will convene uh, in the next half an hour with Wesley's um, sister, Cynthia Townsend, um, for a panel discussion moderated by me. Uh, we welcome our online participants to leave your comments and also questions uh, in the Zoom box here. Um, our speakers will address them during the discussion, and we'll, we will also do open floor questions um, to, um, towards the end uh, of today's conversation. Also, before we start, I'd like to play a warm welcome message recorded by Christina Yen, uh, Chief Curator at the Museum. Hello, everyone. Um, Welcome from the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. I'm Christina Yang, the museum's chief curator, and I'm speaking to you from within our current exhibition, Spiritual Mountains, the Art of Wesley Thompson. I'm delighted to welcome the audience from Hong Kong University's Wesley Thompson Symposium and to be sending you this special video greeting as you kick off your day. I wanna recognize the extraordinary career of Julia White, our former senior curator of Asian art who curated this beautiful exhibition. 
The centerpiece of Spiritual Mountains are about a dozen new acquisitions to the band PFA of Wesley Thompson's work from the Wesley Thompson Charitable Trust. These works are organized in dialogue with a world-renowned collection of historic Chinese paintings, including Shetao and, and Gao Kipei, uh, as well as a growing collection of modern 20th and 21st century masters like Harold Wong and John Wei. Through this intelligently curated exhibition, Wesley Thompson's dialogue with traditional Chinese techniques of landscape painting, demonstrated through his use of multiple perspectives, exquisite brushwork, and vaporous washes of color, is pushed further towards realizing his own authentic style of vigorous expressive mark making and its provocation of certain conventions of still life painting and in handheld fans and in intimate albums, which he expanded to large scale painting. I wish you all a wonderful day of discussion and learning. I hope these delightful images of Wesley Thompson stay with you and are as fresh in your mind's eye as they are before me today. I'd like to send a special thank you to Anki Lee and Cynthia Thompson for inviting me to provide this video greeting. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Okay, now I'd like to introduce our today's speakers. Um, first, um, please allow me to welcome uh, Dr. Rosalind Q. Um, Dr. Q received her doctoral degree in history of art um, from the University of California, Berkeley, specializing in modern and contemporary Chinese art. Currently, she's an assistant professor of uh, art history and Chinese studies at Davidson College, North Carolina. She was a curatorial consultant for the exhibition, Spiritual Mountains, the Art of Wesley Townsend at Benfa, and also authored an article on Wesley Townsend's paintings, published in the January-February issue of Orientations. Dr. Q's presentation today is titled, Wesley Townsend, Techniques in Ink Paintings. Then please allow me to welcome Dr. Ross Hammers. Dr. Hammers uh, is Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Hong Kong. She conducts research on history of Chinese art and also art theory. Her first book, Pictures of Tilly and Weiwei, Art, Labor, and Technology in So and Yuan China, received the College Art Associations, Association's Miller Smith Prize. Her second book, The Imperial Patronage of Labor General Paintings, in 18th century China was published by Rootleg Press in 2021. Dr. Hammer's um, presentation today is titled Spirit, Idea, and Landscape, the Innovative Tradition of Wesley Townsend. Last but not least, joining us today at the panel discussion um, is Ms. Thingsia Townsend, the guardian and also advocate for the legacy of her late brother, Wesley Townsend. Ms. Thompson is a supporter of the Asian Art Archive in America and also Asian Cultural Council. And she currently serves on the um, boards of Chinese Cultural Foundation of San Francisco and also the Bentham Museum. So without further ado, um, let's welcome Dr. Rosalind Q for her first presentation. Thank you, Anji. Can you all hear and see the slide? Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to thank Anchi for organizing this panel discussion today. Uh, thank you to Gar Gallery du Monde for holding this talk, as well as the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive for their support. Thank you especially to Cynthia as well, Wesley's sister, who spearheads the Wesley Thompson Charitable Trust and is a champion to get his work recognized by the arts community across the world. My talk today concentrates on Wesley Thompson's journey and experimentation with ink, highlighting how his works can be understood in the context of traditional Chinese painting. Because of the Berkeley Art Museum's extensive world-class collection of Chinese ink painting, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to assist Julia White, the uh, curator for Spiritual Mountains, in selecting pre-modern and modern Chinese ink paintings that could highlight Wesley Thompson's varied techniques. Wesley Thompson was born in Hong Kong in 1957, and he decided to become a painter at the age of 17. When he first started painting, he created the simplest subject matter in Chinese ink painting, bamboo painting. 
Bamboo is the first subject that traditional Chinese ink painters usually learn because the bases for the simplest strokes to create the bamboo stalks and leaves are based on calligraphy. For example, the bamboo leaves are elongated versions of tian and pie strokes, while the stalks are simply hung, the horizontal strokes turned sideways into vertical strokes. Throughout his career, Thompson painted bamboo using both traditional and experimental techniques, which are both included in the Spiritual Mountains exhibition. Here you can see Tongson's playful rendition of the classical subject matter of bamboo. His adept um, handling of the brush and ink are highlighted through the fei bai or flying white strokes for the stalks of the bamboo. And that you can see in comparison, which we also uh, placed in comparison with Zhu Sheng's painting, um, which is much more traditional in format and technique from the Qing dynasty. In the late 1970s, when he was 20, he traveled to Toronto to study to further his study in the arts. While he was there, he studied under Madame Gu Qingyao, who was also the painting teacher of Harold Wong. Um, he also studied Western painting and was especially interested in the works of Picasso. In his Toronto sketches, uh, which were fortunately preserved, we can see his initial experimentation with splashed ink, which I'll show you here, and combining them with um, cubist techniques. But before we get to an analysis of these paintings, I wanted to give Cynthia, um, ask Cynthia about these sketches, which were almost completely lost. Um, and she has an interesting story to trace how they were preserved. Yes. Um, when Wesley left Toronto in 1981, he did not take his painting back with him to Hong Kong. He left them, he gave them all to my cousin. And for many years, you know, they held on to his paintings. And um, a few years before Wesley passed away, my cousin were ready to downsize to a condo. Um, so I asked Wesley again, uh, do you want some of your paintings back, any of your paintings back, because, you know, we'll be getting rid of them. Um, and he said, no. Then they asked me, whether I wanted it. And my thought at the time was, well, if Wesley didn't want it, why, why would I want it? So no, don't worry about it, do whatever. And um, then fast forward to a few years ago, uh, it was Catherine Mosley. Uh, she's a art historian and curator, and um, she curated a two um, exhibition of Wesley's in Hong Kong and at the Chinese Cultural Center in San Francisco. And she, you know, did a lot of research, of course, into Wesley. She keep on asking me about these Toronto's painting, and she insisted that I really need to look them up because they're really important, especially the experimental works. So um, I then asked my cousin, and you know, do you remember who you give them to? I really need to track them down. And she said, not really. I really don't remember, but let me ask my son. Turns out. Thank goodness for his son that he kept a portfolio of Wesley's work from Toronto. And when I saw the work, these are the experimental works, exactly what we're looking for. Uh, I, I call them the missing link because, you know, uh, we, we absolutely had no record of these work at all. Um, so we were very fortunate that, you know, we we're able to um, kind of like discover them again. And my, my cousin's son kept them and I asked him why he said, because they're so, so beautiful, the color. And he's a designer himself. So he, he's artistic, he has the eye. So thank God for him um, <laughs> who kept these works in exactly what we're looking for. Wow. And, and yeah, and it's in the exhibit. And we're so thankful that they're, uh, they were available for yeah. inclusion in the Spiritual Mountains um, exhibition as well, um, because of the way that Cynthia was saying, it's kind of the missing link, right? These are the, um, after he learned, you know, um, the basis of Chinese ink painting with the bamboo ink paintings, then he went to Toronto and he started experimenting with splash ink as well as um, combining them with his fascination for um, cubism. And so here in this work, um, which is untitled, 
you see his combination of splashed ink techniques, which he hasn't quite mastered yet, right? He's experimenting on his own here. And he's combining it with traditional Chinese ink painting techniques, especially the white or here, um, the red outline um, ink painting. Um, usually the ink painting with very thin outlines are called bai miao painting or uh, white line or plain line painting. And see, you see that he's experimenting with those techniques here as well. Um, in one particular um, monochromatic sketch from Toronto, I saw this, um, when I saw this, I instantly thought of Huang Gong Wang's Clearing After Sudden Snow. Um, this is a classic, uh, painting that everybody who takes intro to Chinese ink painting learns about. And um, this is by a um, one of the four Yuan masters, right? And in this painting, what you see on the right-hand side is Huang Gong Wang's play of space and spatial dimensions that we see reflected also in Wesley Tongson's painting where he's shifting the planes of the mountain and lifting it up so that we can see the painting in all of its totality. Um, and this is a, a, an idea about capturing the totality of a landscape that, um, that traces back to the, um, the ninth and 10th century, right? And I'm sure that, uh, as um, Roz Hammers discusses uh, Guo Xi's early spring in her, um, in her talk, she'll focus on the totality of mountains as well. So when he returned, when Wesley Tongson returned to Hong Kong, he studied in a short class with the Taiwanese painter, Liu Guo Song, who was the leading painter of the Fifth Moon Group in Taiwan. And um, he also studied the paintings of Zhang Daqian um, in the hopes of developing his splashed ink paint technique. And those of you who are not familiar with Zhang Daqian, which I don't think there's anybody who's not familiar with his work, uh, this is a, a great example that we were able to include in the exhibition from a private collection. Um, and here we see the combination of splashed ink in different colors um, that Wesley also was fascinated with. Um, he also studied with Liu Ho Song, as I said, and Liu Ho Song was a um, very innovative, is, is a very innovative painter who um, encouraged his students to manipulate all aspects of the different materials they were, in, uh, they were working with, including the brush, the ink, and as well as the paper. So, let me just go on to um, this slide here. So in 1998, when he had an interview with Tsing Tao, we already see that uh, Wesley Tongson is fascinated with the interplays of color. He states in this 1998 interview, says, uh, quote, I love colors. When layers of colors are splashed onto a piece of paper, shades of colors ranging from dense to light will appear, resembling the landscapes and clouds of Chinese painting. While he continually developed his splashed ink and brush painting techniques, Tongson experimented with different ways to manipulate ink without the brush. Um, in a 1989 article in the Hong Kong Economics Journal, he also speaks about ink marbling. Um, and this article was written when he was 31 years old. Um, so he had been um, experimenting with ink painting for about 14 years at that point. And in that interview, he pointed out how he purposefully does not include brush manipulation in his splashed ink works. Uh, the article uh, states, quote, Wesley believes that color movements in paintings using splashed ink and water printing methods are very dynamic and lively. That is why he prefers not to add any, any brushwork to his splashed ink paintings in order to keep them natural. Thus, in these paintings, um, his 90, 1990 painting, oops, this way, um, Slope, as well as his 1996 painting, 
scudding clouds, misty peaks, we see his probable use of ink marbling rather than brush strokes to suggest textures of the mountain ranges. So the process of ink marbling is really interesting. Um, you, the ink pattern is slowly developed um, and the different hues of ink patterns are slowly developed first um, in a basin of water. So the ink floats on top of that water um, and the pattern is developed. And then the artist will flip the paper into the basin so that the ink gets um, picked up by the paper so that the pattern appears instantly on the paper itself. This process of developing um, a painting is almost the same process, um, you know, physically, the same process of chemical developing, chemically developing a photograph where the photographic paper is placed on in different solutions and then the image appears uh, spontaneously, right? And he often talked about his um, wish and desire to create paintings that were as realistic or all in the same vein as photographs. And I was hoping that, again, I could ask Cynthia to speak a little bit about what Wesley has said, had said about photography. Now, that, that, uh, I just remember, again, a newspaper article that uh, during the interview. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically about this. He has said in that interview that his goal was to splash to the point that the painting looks like a photograph, the mountains look like a photograph. And the um, interviewer asked him, well, in that case, why not a photograph? Why, why don't you just take a photograph? And his answer was, he said, the photograph cannot capture the full range, the majestic of a mountain, while a, a painting can. And also a photograph cannot capture the essence of the mountain, the soul of the mountain, where mm -hmm. a painting can. So the only thing that the painting might not be able to do is to capture the realism of, mm -hmm. of the uh, mountain, which the photograph can do. So maybe why, this is maybe why, I mean, I never asked him, but this prompted me to think that this may be why he, at the time, this was his goal. So it will be like a perfect painting. Uh, but then he did not reach his goal and um, he changed direction very suddenly in about the mid 2000s. He was doing splashing landscape up to that at that point. And he um, said to me because he couldn't go any further and therefore he had to change direction in order to go further. But his direction, the new direction was very, very um, strange to me because he totally went the opposite totally no color, black actually, in fact. <laughs> went back to the monochrome, went back to the brush. He said, I had to go back to there in order to really go forward. And I was very concerned because all these years of practicing, developing this technique, years of the splashing technique, that's it, no more. And he reassured me not to worry because he said he would bring the colors back to his painting. But when that happens, the painting will be uh, at a different, on a different level. And sure enough, at the very end of his life, he did bring color, his bright, beautiful color back to his um, finger painting. And those paintings are really is on a different level. So he did know that. Yeah. It's really interesting how it, become, it comes full circle, um, in, especially in his Spiritual Mountain series, which um, yeah. I'll touch upon at the end. So um, yeah, so this, you know, the idea of capturing the essence that you know, harkens all the way back to the first millennium in Chinese ink painting. Um, and that's something that Guo Xi also speaks about, right? Capturing the totality of a mountain rather than trying to capture all of this, um, all the different aspects of a mountain in a realistic way. So for over a millennium, uh, the goal of Chinese landscape painting has never, has not been to capture reality but to capture the essence of the place or the space. So, um, and I wanna go back to his, I, his technique of marbling, which I think it's very fascinating. Um, th the term was used in one of the uh, 
the newspaper articles that Cynthia was kind enough to share with me. And I looked it up and it was just fascinating how instantly you can transfer an image that's floating on top of a basin of water onto a different material and it, it just appears on that other material. Um, this one where the ink is you know, covering the entire expense of the board, it's almost as if he figured out a way to capture the dense brushstrokes used by modern ink painters like Huang Bing Hong um, and Harold Wong without the use of an ink brush. Right. So uh, we see the same we see the same shift in tones and textures that Huang Bing Hong captured with the density of his ink dots, and which Harold Wong. Um, captured with his careful use of ink tones in different hues, but Wesley Tongson is able to achieve this texture density without using the ink brush at all, but with just, just the manipulation of ink and transference. So here are some um, images of the very tools that he used. And many of the techniques are, um, are still secret, so we're still trying to figure them out because um, Wesley Thompson was a little bit uh, secretive about all of his techniques. Um, and throughout all of his experimentation, it's not to say that he didn't appreciate the expertise that's required to use the ink brush in a way to rival past ink masters. He states in a 1990 interview in the Tsingtao Wen Pao um, publication that, quote, the use of brush brushes is very important in Chinese painting. It takes a long time to practice. The movement of brush strokes is like the playing of the piano, which must be both agile and dashing. Moreover, he also concentrated on a firm understanding of ink tonality, controlling the hues of the monochrome ink to the point that they gained a sense of dimensionality as well as compositional balance. Um, this is something that Harold Wong also emphasized in his own ink painting practice. So Tongson's 1997 painting could be considered studies in ink tonality and composition. If we compare his 1997 untitled work here to Guo Ming's uh, Wind and Snow in the Fir Pines and Gong Xian's uh, paintings of waterfalls at Mount Guanglu, Tongson's growing mastery of ink tonality and composition becomes very apparent where he's balancing out different aspects of the composition. So though the painting on the right, which is Tongson's painting, is a combination of abstract forms, the balance of dark and light tones, together with the interplay of shapes, results in a dynamic yet balanced painting that blurs the lines between what, uh, what could be thought of as opposites, such as inside, outside, transparency, opacity, and lightness and darkness, which are all blurred in this one composition. His, um, his untitled 1998 painting of a pine tree combines dark, saturated, dynamic brushstrokes with the dabbling of tonal light inks to suggest the writhing form of a pine tree. Pines, along with bamboo and plum blossoms, are the three friends of winter, which are often the subject matter of Chinese ink painting. Um, in fact, here are some uh, photographs of his work table in the studio, where he would have, um, um, you know, in a very dynamic manner, painted these um, large ink paintings. And as I mentioned earlier, um, Tongson did, did not allow many people into his studio to see him working. And so I was hoping that I could ask Cynthia once again to comment on like, if you had seen him working at his studio or if you had heard anybody else who had seen him working at his work table to kind of get, um, understand his process. Yeah, he um, he was very secretive because he has a lot of paranoia. Um, so he really generally did not allow people to watch him paint. He might have demonstrated to a few people, but not really what he's seriously painting by himself. But then he, when we're all living together and it was the same household, he used our living room to paint. So it's kind of like you can't avoid not seeing him. But we usually leave him alone and just, you know, did not pay too much attention. And, and my mother even remembered this. Um, 
that, you know, Wesley is very spontaneous when the idea, the image will come to him, he had to put it down on paper, doesn't matter what time it is. And um, he never really had any sketches or anything like that. So he will just start by going around the table, around and around, he might make a sound, one like one tone sound, and almost like getting into a, a trance, getting, getting into a trance kind of like, um, uh, before he will start working. So uh, this is something my mother remember. And when she, when she talked about it, I kind of like had this image in my head too. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and he will be kind of like in a song. Then we will be going by, doing stuff, making noise. It's like as if he, he wouldn't hear us. Uh -huh. Yeah, and you mentioned that he also never did any like preliminary sketches. He, uh -huh. he saw an image in his mind and then transferred it onto the paper instantly. That's how it so. worked. Yeah. Um, so let's see. I also, you know, in in our celebration of his his innovation and experimentation with ink, I also don't want to overlook his great mastery of brush work. Um, in the exhibition Spiritual Mountains, um, Wesley Tongson's Untitled Pine from 1998 is placed in the same gallery as um, Schertau's painting of a lotus from 1704. And here you can see the same spontaneity of handling the brush, a mastery demonstrated by the Fei Bai or flying white brush stroke that can be seen in Schertau's reeds and Tongsen's pine needles. Moreover, the ability to combine different ink tonalities to suggest um, dimensionality echo the techniques of Qing dynasty eccentrics such as Li Fangying and Wu Chengshuo, who are also, uh, these two works are also included in the exhibition. Li was one of the eight eccentrics of Yangzhou, and Wu was an antiquarian ink painter active in Shanghai in the late 19th and early 20th century. In both of these works um, by the experimental painters, um, you see that ink tonality and viscosity are carefully controlled, suggest a three-dimensionality that only expert ink painters could achieve through sparse um, brush strokes. So here's uh, Wesley Tomlinson's, a detail of Wesley Tomlinson's um, pine from 1998. And you see that same mastery in terms of the light ink tonality that he uses for the pine branches um, that is found in Qing Dynasty paintings. By around, and by around 2009, Wesley Tongson was working mainly with his fingers and did not use the brush to finish his monumental monochrome ink paintings. Yet he maintained his expertise in tonality and composition, transferring them to his ink painting works. In his finger paintings, we see a virtuosic manifestation of all aspects of ink painting that were now second nature to him. Tonality, composition, and spontaneity of strokes, now made with his fingers, all combined to create a vibrant work, which can be seen as both a painting of an orchid and rock, seen here, um, but if you, uh, when you're in the gallery, if you have a chance to visit, if you step back a little bit, um, the orchid and rock almost seems like a monumental landscape painting. So if we compare it to a vertical landscape painting, um, such as uh, Shang Mao, uh, Shang Mao painting from the mid 17th century, Tongson's painting of orchid and rocks resemble a monumental landscape painting with a waterfall. Rather than a landmass in the foreground to balance out the composition, Tongson instead uses tufts of orchid leaves emerging from the crevices of the rock in, on the left-hand side to balance it out so that we see both um, microcosmic representation of an orchid and rock and a macrocosmic, possible macrocosmic representation of mountain and waterfall. While experimenting with ink paintings, uh, finger painting, he blows up the traditional hand, hand scroll format, creating instead a monumental horizontal ink painting on paper in 2012. At the top, Tongson signs the painting with his sobriquet, Mountain Taoist, and marks his age 50 years old, 54 years old. 
Floating amidst the fantastical gorges, we see an apsara, a female spirit or celestial traversing the negative spaces in its ambiguous form. And in his final series, Spiritual Mountains, which he completed in 2012, we see that he combines finger painting techniques that he relied on, um, dripping ink into sinewy lines, his control of his splashed ink technique, and the addition of ink marbling uh, for the final layer of vivid turquoise running across the center of the composition. In the Spiritual Mountain series, we find the culmination of all of Thompson's experimental phases in his play with ink. Thank you. Should we do questions now or wait until later? Anshu? Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was, uh, um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Rosalind. Uh, I think we can save the questions for later when we uh, coming together. And, and yeah, everyone feel free to leave your questions uh, in the chat box. And maybe now let's welcome uh, Ross. Okay, so thank you. Uh, I'm, I hope you can see, oh no, you can see me. Okay, I'm sorry. This is always a problem. Stop share. I did it the wrong way. Let me start by saying uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, perhaps. Um, I know everyone's coming from different places and you still cannot see my new share. Let me try a new share. I hate when technology doesn't work. All right, excuse me. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to stop the share yet again. I'm going to stop this escape, excuse me. Now I'm going to try again, share screen. Here we go. I think this is going to work. And yes, you can see my, my slides. I hope so. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so yes, um, welcome everybody to, to this um, event. I would like to thank my panelists today for making this event possible, and especially um, Anchi Lee, who um, organized this discussion. Um, <clears throat> I start today's talk with a view of the present exhibition of, the Wesley, Tong of Wesley Tongson at the Berkeley Museum of Art and Public and, and Pacific Film Archive, a show that invites viewers to engage with the artist's representations of mountains as spiritual. The associations between mountains and spirituality abound in many religions, for mountains at times are imposing and grand. In many religions, including Buddhism and Christianity, mountains can be regarded as places in the landscape that are closer to the celestial realm. Metaphorically, or by association, mountains confer a sense of greatness in secular and in spiritual realms to the person who scales their heights. So for today, I'm taking some of these generalizations about mountains as a way to consider the art of Wesley Tongson um, in traditional Chinese and in view of traditional Chinese culture and art history. This is going to be a bit of the greatest hits of traditional pre 20th century Chinese painting in order to provide some understanding of what I think inspired Tongson in his artistic accomplishments. My goal is to provide an art historical overview um, to offer my observations, interpretations, and some speculation, encouraging thinking with the imagery Tongson has created. Tongson drew upon earlier concepts of Chinese landscape painting, as we've just seen, uh, with its emphasis on mountains, and I would like to consider this rich heritage as well. At, at the same time, however, Tongson's work was included in an exhibition of modern Chinese artists in Hong Kong in 1980s. 
Um, for the present purposes, I'm going to use modern painting as a body of art that is dated to say like the late 19th um, to the 20th centuries. And it's not very much concerned with making things uh, look as they appear. Modernist painting is a kind of art that prefers expressionism over resemblance and tends to emphasize the flat surface of the canvas or paper. Now, as a modern artist, Tongson explored contemporary art practices to articulate his understanding of, him, of, of his self, his ideas, and his time. So while he was inspired by Chinese tradition, he was also seeking to innovate them in order to express his contemporary perspective. I would like to situate mountains in the visual history of China, Chinese culture, by looking at four examples of landscape painting to discuss the concepts related to mountains, while also drawing out changes in the representations that signal shifts in the meanings of mountains. These changes also relate to the ideas about artistic expression to which Wesley Tongson responded and revitalized. Let us first turn to consider some of the ideas of mountains within traditional Chinese culture. I first present a three-dimensional mountain, a hill, uh, I'm sorry, a bronze hill sensor that would have had held burning incense. Here's another image. The sensor made of bronze with gold inlay is one of several that were found in aristocratic Han dynasty. So this is roughly, I'm going to say third century BCE or third century BC to around third century CE or third century AD. Um, that these would have been found in that era's tombs and at least one was found in that of an emperor. In this era, the emperor went to a mountain, typically identified as Mount Tai, to perform rituals that demonstrated his accomplishments as a ruler. The ritual offerings made at the mountain empowered the emperor through a recreation of the celestial approval he had earned when attaining his imperial status. Moreover, some of these emperors um, were also in search of immortality when performing these rituals. I want to thank Rosalind or, or Dr. Kyo, uh, the, previous, the previous speaker of tonight's event for encouraging me to comment on the connection between mountains, Taoism and immortality. In early China, immortals lived in mountains and the queen mother of the West, a goddess associated with Taoism resided on Mount Kunlun. Taoism as a system of thought or belief concerns itself with the apprehension of the forces of the cosmos. Taoists in general seek to align their spiritual actions to be in accord with nature. Wesley Tongson, as we've seen, was deeply impressed in it, so much so that he referred to himself as the Shan Dao or Shan Do Daoren, or Taoist Mountain Man. The hill sensor um, on a stand is in the shape of a mountain surrounded by water with and complete with animals and other creatures and laid on it. As a sensor, it would have had burning incense that would have produced smoke and the mountain would have been enlivened by smoky mist that would have emanated from holes strategically placed in a misty atmosphere. And we'll get back to this. Jumping ahead as I must, um, one of the most famous paintings that, that um, also maintains an aristocratic and luxurious connection to the landscape is Emperor Ming Huang's journey to Shu. This painting is considered an 11th or 12th century version of a painting by the Tong court painter Li Jiadao um, of the 8th century. Um, the back story is a bit complicated, but briefly put, Emperor Ming Huang of the Tong, um, had, which oh, the Tong I should say is roughly 7th century to 10th century CE, um, had to flee the capital because of a rebellion. He takes refuge in Shu, an area that is presently known as Sichuan province. Scholars consider um, this figure in the front of the bridge to be Emperor Ming Huang. This one here. Um, the landscape in this painting may serve as a representation of the domain or the empire that the emperor possesses, as a place in which the emperor may also seek sanctuary. This very colorful painting is difficult to reproduce because the pigments are minerals 
and they shimmer when you see the painting in person. The pigments were and still are expensive, so the very making of this painting invites associations of material wealth. This landscape is in what art historians refer to as the Tang Dynasty blue-green style, where the dominant colors are of those two hues. I also want to point out that the ochre or the orange-brown color is another important one used in Tang landscape painting. We can also see again white mist coiling about in the, in the painting, activating a sense of liveliness in the atmosphere. Emperor Ming Huang's journey to Shu is one of the most traditional, one of the most famous traditional paint, landscape paintings in the history of Chinese art. And it's here it stands for that tradition as a vibrant color landscape painting. So let's uh, brace ourselves here for a transition to a colorful landscape painting by uh, Thompson. Oops, sorry, that was backwards, forwards, here we go. Um, one done nearly a millennium later. In Thompson's Mountains of Heaven, number 161, um, done in 2000, I'm struck by the intensity of the gorgeous colors in the sky and in the foreground. The green blue of the mountains have a scouring of white across them. This white may refer to mist or perhaps functions to bring the mountains to the surface of the work of art, flattening the land ma mass of a green with some deep blue. So again, I'm starting to suggest maybe this is a modernist kind of a flattening effect. Um, in comparison, the two paintings, I think we can detect some similarity in the composition with the subject matter of mountain, some references to color. I am not saying that Tongson's work is a direct response to the Tong Dynasty painting or its copy, but I am suggesting that Tongson was aware of paintings in the Tong tradition to radically rework them. He grants the viewer a large momentous landmass with somewhat familiar or somewhat similar proportions, but negates its spatial recession. And Tongson enlivens the atmosphere with a wider range of luminous and brilliant colors available to him in his time. I would also like now to consider some of the landscape paintings Tongson executed in black ink. So not surprisingly, I return to the history of Chinese art to offer some thoughts about the appeal of monochromatic ink painting. We have glorious paintings of the landscapes as a sanctuary for the emperor. However, at the same time, we can also detect some populist sentiments in poetic responses to landscape. Here I present a poem by, uh, by Zhu Yi, or in classical Chinese, Bo Zhu Yi, um, a great poet of the Tang era, who was nearly contemporaneous with uh, Emperor Ming Huang. Bai Zhu Yi writes, spectacular sites originally have no established owners. Mountains mostly belong to those who love mountains. Um, we can also see that Abaiju Yi is going to personify land into friends um, and teachers for him. Uh, here we have uh, water is, well, you can read that. Okay. This is also probably at the same time, this is possibly the same time, more or less, when monochromatic ink may be regarded as more intellectually rigorous than all those dazzling colors associated with material splendor and pigments. Now, this state last comment I made is, is speculative and there's been many a book written about this. So it's very complicated, but I'm just saying that for us, it sets the stage for the great monochromatic monumental landscape painting of the Song Dynasty. And, and here we have uh, Guo Xi as uh, um, Rosaline, Rosaline um, mentioned. Um, this painting is by Guo, Guo Xi and it is considered a great masterpiece. Um, it's called Early Spring, done in 1072. Turning, moving to a detail, we can see dynamic brushwork that allows for spatial recession that gives it a sense of depth. Here we can see people crossing a bridge, if you look closely. Moving in closer still, the blank silk appears as if pale water with streams gathering into a pool. The black ink around the unpainted silk 
provides stark contrast in order to emphasize the luminosity of the depicted water. Different shades of ink diluted with real water are layered upon one another in order to develop a sense of volume. Trees in their branches are painted with a controlled yet, yet within a controlled yet prickled brushwork. Apparently, Guoxi told his son about the value of landscape and mountains, and his son wrote the artist's thoughts down in an extremely important essay. I think it's very important for understanding the role of mountains. Um, and this is this essay is the uh, called the lofty message of forests and streams, uh, Lin Chuan Gaozhi. Um, and here we can read. This is what uh, Guoxi apparently said to his son, who recorded it. Why does a virtuous man take delight in landscapes? It is for these reasons, that in a rustic retreat, he may nourish his nature. Amid the carefree play of streams and rocks, he may take delight. That he may constantly meet in the country, fishermen, woodcutters, and hermits, and see the soaring of cranes, and hear the crying of monkeys. The din of the, du the dusty world and the locked inness of human habitations are what human nature habitually abhors, while on the contrary, haze, mist, and the haunting spirits of the mountains are what human nature seeks, yet can rarely find. This essay is very interesting in that we have a textual explanation for the grandness of Song landscape painting and its appeal. It is a place of solace, of refuse for everyone, well, especially for those, everyone who lives in the city and needs to escape the demands of society, if only temporarily. Um, again, the problem is one has to take care of one's family and, and have a job. So um, that those things mandate uh, residing in urban space. Now, shifting over to return to uh, Tongsen's art, I consider that he was in visual dialogue with the Song and the slightly later Yuan era. Um, uh, dynasty or the UN monumental landscape painting tradition. The size of his monochromatic ink painting entitled, uh, I'm sorry, unentitled of the Spiritual Mountain series of 1012 is even more monumental in scale. That is to say, it's larger than that of Guoxi's. Um, I took an estimate, I, it looked to me about 100 inches in height with a width of about 45 inches. Um, I, I believe it to be bigger than the, I, there weren't exact inches, but I believe it to be bigger than even Guo Xi's painting. Um, as we can see for Tongsen, his, his brushwork or finger work is vigorous, intensely expressive, and indicates the action of his hand. That is to say the presence of his physical gestures, they're emphasized, yet the connection to the representation of a landscape is definitely maintained. Tongsen's proportions and aspects, some of the aspects of the formal qualities, that is the central act, the central vertical axis, the contrast between intense black and blank surface, to my eye indicate that he was inspired by the Song tradition, um, albeit working in a very different time period. His approach towards landscape painting with its flatter surface is informed by living in the 20th and 21st century. Um, and I just want to also say as a quick aside, it's not that difficult for someone in Hong Kong. Well, it wasn't so difficult for someone in Hong Kong to fly to Taipei uh, to see the original um, Guoxi painting. Um, again, there, it's not always on display, but one can see this painting in Taipei, a very short plane flight away. Um, moreover, um, Guoxi, our, our Song Dynasty artist, gives us an explanation of his method for painting landscapes. To learn to paint landscape too, the method is the same. An artist should identify with its significance and watch until its significance is revealed to him. Okay, so um, this is a bit about, you know, you have to observe and you have to think. It's not just merely um, copying a landscape, it's, it's, it's understanding it. Um, and, and this could be very um, real practical advice that he's suggesting as well. Uh, you do need to observe the clouds and the atmosphere of real landscape are not the same throughout the four seasons. So you need to you need to be careful. You need to think about it. You need to respond. You need to understand it. 
Um, so now um, getting closer to Tungsten's time, I'm, I'm now going to uh, talk also about the same artist, um, uh, Shertal, who was living in the Qing dynasty. And Qing is, let's just say 1644 to 1912, uh, yeah, 1912. Um, um, and this is Shertal. Um, and Shertal has very sort of modern sounding things to say. Um, that is to say, modern sounding as in the art of the 19th and 20th century kind of ideas. Um, Tongson wrote about how he was greatly inspired by Shertal's ideas and paintings. The Spiritual Mountain Exhibition exhibits a series of album leaps by Shertal entitled Reminiscences of Nan Jing, um, dated to 1704. And I'm, I'm giving you one example. In this painting, we can see some of the sense of play and liberty that Shertal exhibited in his highly original depictions of mountains. Shirthouse Mountain is curiously coiled, curved, and carved into a geological marble. Shirthouse was a highly expressive artist who also wrote about and inscribed his paintings about his artistic process. Um, this next landscape is from what the late eminent professor emeritus of the University of California, James F. Cahill, referred to as everybody's favorite album series by Shirthouse. Um, the album for Taoist You. Putting aside the Taoist reference for a minute, I have to confess that I too share uh, affection for, these, for this series of paintings. For those interested in these extraordinary paintings and their history, I include a website address so that you, you may lo learn more and hear Professor Cahill's insightful observations about them in a YouTube video. Now, going back to Shirthouse's method, in the last album leaf, Shertal wrote, this method that is no method, in fact, makes up my method. Now, this is kind of a crazy bold statement in which the artist himself is determining his agency to create imagery freely by his own approach to making imagery. And I should, yeah, okay. Um, and again, this is really amazing. We have um, European modern artists of say the mid, 19th century, such as perhaps Gustave Courbet, who claimed that he painted to reject the classical training, the classical tradition, and to fight for his intellectual freedom. Schertau seems to, re to reject all methods, except for the one method of actually doing painting. Um, uh, he wrote that when the mind breaks away completely from the restricting framework of established conventions and methods of painting, one's painting will naturally be like an immortal gliding in the wind. Or when the artist is not following rules, they are free. What can be less constrained than a floating immortal? Again, we have a reference to immortality. As, and as already mentioned, Schertau's uh, provocative album leaves are for the Taoist you. This further underscores the artist's Shertau's interest in Taoism. For Shertau, Taoism can be construed as developing a personal identification with nature and its generative active processes, which inspired his creative production of painting, especially evidence and perhaps um, particularly appropriate in landscape painting. Using Taoism in part as a dynamic foundation, Shertau was able to throw open options for artists to freely and critically explore their ideas about self-expression and the merits of tradition and overturning tradition. These ideas are still in circulation today, and I argue they certainly inspired uh, Tongson. If we return to Tongson's monumental landscape painting to which I've just suggested as a response to Song or 11th century art, we can also see elements of Shertau's forms. Another album lay from the Taoist Yu series has a fist shaped mountain that thrusts itself upward. So we've got this sort of curious thing going here. I see um, Tongson as integrating the style of the Song monumental landscape painting tradition with the liberated, the immortal gliding in wind approach of Shu Tao. To my eye, 
one of the best paintings, and I was very pleased to see that Rosalind included it in her uh, presentation as well, um, that displays his deep engagement with Schertau, with tradition, and his ambitions to expand the space, the art historical narration, uh, narrative, sorry, the art historical narrative for his individual expression is the spiritual mountain number six of 2012. Again, this is a monumental painting. And in, and in it, he brings together liberated brushwork, dynamic rhythmic tracings of his fingernails or fingers, lively ink spills, brilliant colors, evocative of the blue green style and a visual symphony of a chaotic yet controlled and balanced landscape with, of course, mountains. Wildly exuberant, Tongson activates the depiction of the mountain in an enlivened space to announce his presence as the creator of the vision. I found that when I was viewing the painting, I was moving my hand in an effort to understand the motions he needed to create the black lines that delineate the billows of the clouds, wanting to replicate Tongson's traces of his hand. He made the layers of swirling configurations by hand and perhaps by brush that coalesce and come together in a whirlwind to form a landscape, one that is at times flattened by surface bound shapes of turquoise blue and white. In Spiritual Mountains, the art of, the art of Wesley Tongson, we can see a tension between appeals to traditional representation and to forms that refer to modernist or contemporary art. Finding inspiration in earlier Chinese painting and solace in Shirtao, Tongson took the subject of mountains in a landscape as a means to lodge his expression. As an ambitious painter, he took from traditional paintings and included formal qualities from modernist painting. As the Berkeley Art Museum curator, Julie White has commented, the exhibition explores the art historical traditions that Tongson drew upon to make innovative paintings that engage with contemporary artistic practices. I hope that through the all too brief art historical review, overview that I've presented, we can consider the larger historical environment that Tongson immersed himself um, into in order to peek at some of the changes in the meanings of mountains and their imagery. We can see Tongson as an artist who embraced Schertau's examples. Um, however, ultimately, Tongson, as a contemporary artist, possessed an original vision of landscape, creating them with highly inventive styles to find refuge in his spiritual mountains. Um, thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. Thank you so much, Ross. Um, I think maybe it's the time for us to have uh, Cynthia and also Rosalind join us together for the panel discussion. But since Ross just finished our presentation, I think I'm going to ask the first questions to you because um, I really, really enjoyed this um, beautiful uh, historical context you provided just now um, for everyone to better understand uh, like Wesley's interest uh, in his subject matters. Um, and I'm also very interested uh, uh, to see like uh, his change of um, having his um, style from a more like controlled style um, to a more freed, um, also more animated um, way of using the lines, using brush strokes, including like his hands as well. So I'm curious um, to know like your opinion, like. Um, what do you think like made him or of course to a lot of like old masters like um, there's um, changing styles from like in this uh, in this fashion um, like kind of like why we see um, Wesley's work um, now that's um, like this change from um, uh, maybe like similar style we see in like Wesley's work mm -hmm. and then later on maybe like more sh shit house. Um. Right, I, I, I think I think if, if I may paraphrase, you're, you're sort of asking why was at some point there's this idea of skill of a need to make things look naturalistic to be able to observe and, and then how do we get to 
this really expressive sort of wildly loose kind of thing um, that that still can be the image still can be recognized as um, a yeah. mountain, but it's very much imbued with an expressive quality of the artist as the maker. Well, I, I think that this has to do with uh, changing definitions of what is good painting, what yeah. makes painting good. Um, and I think that um, we can say initially, perhaps even as, our, okay, so historically, let's just take it as history. Historically, there was a great desire for skill. Um, I'm going to say that that's definitely the case um, skill in the Tang dynasty, but skill at that point or talent was more defined by the ability to have resemblance, to have the appearance. And I'm, I'm starting to suggest that with somebody like Bai Juyi, um, talking about the love of mountains and, and thinking about them as animate um, personifications of people, that they can be friends, that they can be teachers, that we're seeing that nature is becoming something you know, that's that's something that the artist can engage with. And when we get to Guo Shi, who is still very, very skillful and talented and very capable of making a representation and resemblance, but he's starting to really want to think about what is the value of this? What does it mean? And there is a definite spiritual connection. You go to a mountain to take refuge, to find solace. And so I think that this has been a foundation that was laid. Um, and as artists began to think more about expressive possibilities. Uh, he himself, you know, well, she says, you know, the artist has to look at it and understand it or understand landscape and have it be revealed. And I think that that idea just got greater and greater to be simplistic about it, but it got very, very important. And so the idea of an artist is expressing himself is something or herself, I should say, is something that is becoming more prominent. Um, well, it's always been there, but the liberation, the freedom, is something that's being emphasized certainly by Schurtel. And I think as an ambitious painter who wants to do you know, ambitious work, Wesley Thompson was definitely thinking about this long view of history, um, having examples of what was great painting at the time or viewed as great painting in the 20th, 21st century. And so I think that that really inspired him to think about a direction that he could take. Now, he doesn't want to paint like Schurtel. He doesn't want to be, in my opinion, um, I, I presume he wouldn't want to be like, oh, look, this is a guy doing Schurtel. That's not really quite, I think, what Wesley was about in, my, in, in looking at his work. It seems to me he's like, I wanted people to know, yes, I'm aware of Schurtel, but I'm going to push even further. And, um, you know, Schurtel is really breaking the mold. And so Tongson is really, really getting a lot of um, energy and effort and, and, you know, just expressive manifestations outward that are coming on the paintings that, that they're quite extraordinary. So that I'm just gonna say it's um, changing definitions of good painting and the ambition, the great ambition of the artist to do something beyond what's accepted. Yeah, thank you very much, Rose. Um, maybe the next follow-up question will um, um, we'll dedicate it to um, Rosalind and also uh, Cynthia, because um, since we're already talking about so many like good masters that's been influencing the um, the techniques, uh, the styles, also like um, the spirit, the spirit um, Wesley wants to depict in his works. Um, do you know like how did he um, uh, like learn or how did he get inspired like from Rosalind's um, uh, presentation? I know like he has like studied with um, different um, painters um, uh, as a student. Um, but I'm also curious, like, was he able to see a lot of work in person? And um, how did he like form the style of, uh, and how did he form his like learning? This is a question for me? Yeah, to you and not to <laughs> Rosa as well. <laughs> okay, thank you, Angie. By the way, thank you uh, for having me here. I really appreciate it uh, to joining the, the discussion. Thank you. Um, Wesley, um, really very well read. He really read a lot of books and he attended many, many exhibitions as much as he could. That was something he, um, he, he did. So he had really deep knowledge from books mainly um, 
uh, of, of the traditional Chinese painting. And of course, he had the very, very solid foundation from two teachers, and that is uh, Madame Gu Qingyu when he was in Toronto, and, mm -hmm. and, and then Harold Wong. So from, from, from those two teachers, he really got a very good foundation and knowledge of Chinese painting. And then he studied further by uh, doing a lot of reading. Um, he was in, um, he didn't really travel that much, but he was in Taipei and was, was um, visited the museum there. And, you know, when he's Toronto, he also visited the museum, but, uh, but he didn't really travel that much. And of course in Hong Kong, he would, you know, go to the Hong Kong Museum of Art. Uh, and, and, you know, um, and the other museums. So he kind of learned on his own, mostly. Uh, he, I think he's very, he was very bright. He really absorbed like a sponge very fast. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Anything to add on, Frozen? I'm curious to know if Wesley had access to um, the collections in Madame Guccino's and um, Harold Wong's family, uh, you know, his, their collections of paintings. Because I know they had extensive collections as well. I, I don't know, possibly that they show they you know they discuss and show they they showed mm -hmm. him possibly, yes. Yeah. Um Cynthia, maybe it's also a good time um, for you to tell us more about um, maybe the, the background and also the stories behind um, this exhibition at um, Berkeley right now. Um, can you tell us more about um, the, the donation and also how this exhibition come together? Okay, um, it all started at 2018 at the Wesley Thompson, the Journey exhibition at the Chinese Cultural Center in San Francisco. Um, Julie White came to that exhibit and the preview. And later that evening, I met one of the trustee of the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, then PFA. And she boldly asked me whether I would consider uh, making a donation to the museum and invited me to visit the museum in my subsequent trips. So that was a very bold um, request in, in, in the first, first time I met her. And, but it prompted me to think about um, Ben PFA uh, might be a good permanent home for some of Wesley's work. So um, uh, on the later trip, I met with Julia White and had good conversation with her and, the, and visited the museum, of course. And the more I learned about Van PFA, the more I felt that it was a very good home for Wesley work. There were three factors that were very important to me. Number one, they are UC Berkeley uh, Art Museum, uh, has a tremendous educational program. And they even have a um, Asian Art Study Center, the James Cahill Asian Art Study Center where the students and the vis uh, visitors can have direct access to view the historical Asian paintings in the museum collection. So I, I was quite impressed about that. Um, also the museum already has a very important and well-known Chinese historical painting collection. With Wesley's work so tied to tradition, I felt that his contemporary works will make a very, you know, very good uh, addition to the museum collection. And then the third point was that um, Ben PFA is always, they champion, I love the fact that they champion for under-recognized and underrepresented artists. So that's the three main reason for this large donation that I felt, uh, you know, is a very good home for Wesley. And um, Julie White, and at the time, the director, like Ray Reinder, was so excited about this donation that Julie immediately had thought about um, showcasing them, just the 11 paintings, um, right away. It was a surprise to me. I did not expect that. But so it was going to be in the smaller gallery. But when the painting arrived, I guess the sheer size of these large works finally could really see them spread out. Uh, she realized that I think she need more wall space that need to move to a larger gallery that the smaller gallery would not work. And she had this idea of combining Wesley's 
work with the historical Chinese paintings uh, in the museum collection. And um, I thought it was a brilliant idea because it's a very well match. It's a really good match. And really to, to give Wesley's work in the historical context and for the historical work to have a contemporary context. And I understand from Julia that really is the first time that the museum uh, exhibit, exhibited the, the historical work in this context. Yeah. So uh, because of the pandemic, um, some of the, you know, the exhibition had to be postponed. Julie had more time to work on it. So the exhibition just kept growing into now a second gallery. And um, because Julie had wanted to include more 20th century artists, not just Wesley's teacher, uh, Pero Wong and Lo Guo Chou. Mm -hmm. so, so that's how the um, exhibition came about. Thank you, thank you. Um, and to Rosalind, because you are um, in the curatorial team for this exhibition, so I um, also want to know more about your role. Uh, also, like how did this exhibition help you shape your knowledge uh, of your understanding of uh, Wesley? Well, um, Julia White first introduced me to Wesley Thompson's work by mentioning him. And then uh, we went to the uh, museum storage space where we could see all of the artworks that had just recently arrived. And when I first saw them, I was just struck by how different they were <laughs> to each other um, because the, you know, he went through so many phases of experimentation with ink and brush and then no longer with brush that it was quite shocking to see them in real life. Um, I had seen the, uh, the Journey exhibition catalog, but it was a different matter altogether to see it in person. Um, and Julia has kindly um, invited me to start helping out with the exhibition prep by picking um, um, historical works and suggesting some historical works in the collection, um, even though she's much more familiar with the uh, collection currently at the Berkeley Art Museum, I was able to help out um, because of my experience while studying, um, while being a graduate student at Berkeley, and then also as the postdoctoral fellow at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. So it was a great privilege to be able to um, see the works, you know, when it was first, when they first arrived and then um, unpacked. Um, and then to help with figuring out how to, you know, position everything, put different paintings in conversation with each other so that um, a novice visitor to the museum who doesn't know anything about Chinese ink painting can really understand and appreciate uh, Wesley Tongson's contemporary ink works uh, because of, you know, the way that we were trying to frame it in this historical context. Because without that historical context, I think it would be easy to overlook many of the techniques that he was incorporating into his paintings. And so we wanted to really um, be specific about the types of techniques he was incorporating, what he was changing, the innovations that he was making, um, so that the novice visitor could really understand what he had achieved. Um, and it was a great opportunity to also learn about a completely new artist because this, you know, this is why Cynthia is doing the work that she's doing through the charitable trust is to make sure that people understand his contribution to contemporary ink painting mm -hmm. and to appreciate what he's, um, what he, the new techniques he came up with. So, yeah, it was an honor. Thank, thank you, Rosalind. Um, so Ross, I know you're also in Berkeley, so you, you visit the exhibition in person, you saw the works. And like back in 2019, you also uh, went to this um, book launch and also lecture in, in Hong Kong at Asia Society, also about Wesley's work. So uh, I'm curious about, um, do you have a different impression of Wesley's work now after seeing his work um, in person? Well, that's a great question. And in fact, it's kind of follows up on uh, Rosalind's uh, comments about being a curator. Um, I think that the in, in, in my opinion, and, and I, you know, Catherine Monsley um, did a very interesting, great job of getting a narrative out, just getting out, there is this artist, Wesley Tongson. And that was the impression I got that that was what she was really, I mean, she was, she had a, 
a very nice arrangement of images and an explanation of who he was as a person and documenting his art visually and the ideas he was expressing in them through text and image. And the discussion at Asia Society was very pleasant. Cynthia was there. I think uh, Tina Pong was the um, moderator. So again, it was it was just very nice hearing about uh, Wesley and finding out that there was this, this amazing, amazing and innovative artist uh, in re recent innovative artist um, in Hong Kong. Um, so that was quite exciting to actually come to the exhibition. So that was a presentation that I viewed. Um, I didn't go to the uh, San Francisco Asia show, uh, the San Francisco Asia culture show, uh, Asian American culture show. But I, you know, here, obviously, I have been able to see the Wesley, Wesley Thompson's art. And I'm really struck by its, I mean, as, as Rosaline was saying, or as Rosalind was saying, there's a very different experience of the, you know, it's like, it's very corporal where you're looking at a huge painting um, or even smaller things that have great dynamism. The impact is very different. And so uh, it's been a great pleasure to uh, interact with the paintings always personally and to think about really directly um, in a very direct visual way about some of the movements that, um, Wesley must have been doing in order to make those paintings. I really feel a sense of touch, of gesture, of tracing to make these uh, to make these paintings. So it's been a, it's a, been a really um, a, a very inspiring opportunity to find out more about about his work and experience it. Yeah, thank you, Ross. Um, and today's our um, program is titled "Home and the Way." Um, because um, Wesley's a, a Hong Kong artist and um, this show is actually happening um, in um, California. And also from what Cynthia just shared with us, we know uh, Wesley also kind of moved between Hong Kong and Toronto. He lived at different places. So um, this question is to Cynthia. So uh, can you share with us like how does, how did Wesley um, identify himself? Like does he see himself um, Hong Kong artist, or um, did he ever describe himself as um, someone who's in this, this uh, diasporic culture? Um, I think Wesley always identified himself as a Hong Kong Chinese, a Hong Kong artist. He, 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 although he lived, he lived in um, Toronto for four years, but he never really immersed into the North American uh, culture. But that was an extremely important period for him, the four years in Toronto, because it has a high influence uh, on his practice. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, he um, only, you know, paint, do the traditional Chinese painting, and he was still learning from Madame Guitinho, traditional Chinese painting, uh, while he was in Toronto. But by, you know, but uh, by taking courses at the Ontario School of Art, it really, uh, his first exposure to Western style of painting, it kind of opened up his eyes and mind to you know, uh, working with colors and, and the Western way of painting. And it is also the time that he, he set his new directions for his art practice. And that is um, fusing the East and West, combining the East and West to um, create his own distinctive um, style. And this was also the time that I guess he um, discovered Picasso uh, Picasso was his favorite artist from the West. He was highly influenced by Picasso's um, the uh, Cubism, the and and he he wrote in his note. I think 2000, 2008, He was already age fifty one at the time. He said he really wanted to illustrate, you know, uh, uh, for his painting, his work. He really wanted to illustrate another facet of Picasso's idea of Cubism. So this all came from that four years period uh, in North, you know, in North America. I see. And more about the idea of home and way. So, uh, Roz and also Rosalind, you you are uh, American um, scholars, curators, uh, specialists in Chinese art. So, um, can you um, help uh, all of us to better understand the importance of doing research of Chinese artists um, overseas. Um, uh, well, um, 
I, I'm going to say that uh, briefly put, it's a big question, uh, briefly put, <laughs> and I'm going to try to be brief because I, I do talk too much. Um, briefly put, um, my background way back when um, is in studio um, art, and I was very interested in these questions about skill and expression and how there seems to be a tension between what is considered appropriate painting or what's good painting. Um, so when I worked through some of these ideas and got very interested in modern art, I was kind of surprised to discover how closely connected um, inspiration from Asia or knowledge of Asia, how important that was for uh, modern artists. And I think at that point I realized that if I really want to understand, I need to consider um, who, what, what, what was going on in, in the original context. And so that's partly um, what inspired me or what encouraged me to like really look into uh, discovering what Asian art and Asian art theory had to offer to what, what were modern and contemporary artists using, what were they taking from to create their works of art that in some ways were trying to erase or perhaps as according to David Clark, uh, who wrote uh, his uh, dissertation on this, sort of an erasure of, of the Asian, like the modern artists are doing this in their own thing. And his documentation suggests, well, they were doing that, their own thing, but in part because they knew about Asian art and, and they were trying to sort of mitigate that and make those claims go away. So I really found that to be very interesting and fascinating. So I, so I went back further. And I think it's very important to understand history of artists. Uh, for me, uh, why I study Asian art and why I'm um, actually understanding my own approach to Asian art is because um, the, the length of time that Asian art allows me to understand is so much broader than if I decided, if I had decided to specialize in American art, right? It's just 300 years versus 3,000 years, <laughs> um, which I think puts, puts myself, uh, helps me put myself in a better perspective in terms of like time span and how, how much we're like kind of just flips, but then also appreciate somebody like Wesley Tongson coming along and changing the, the trajectory, you know, in, in their own way, in a very meaningful way. Um, and the other reason is I have this longer goal or, um, a larger goal of trying to expand people's understanding of what Asia means um, to include things beyond mainland China, Japan, and India, which is what we usually learn about in Asian art surveys, right? And so that's another reason why this exhibition is so important is to include artists who are, you know, from Hong Kong, who are from the broader re or broader Chinese diaspora region as well, right? And include them in the canon of how Chinese art has developed. I still have some follow-up questions, but we also have many good questions in here from the audience. So I think I will just some of them now. Um, I see several questions about um, the color paintings of Wesley Thompson. Um, we have Ray asking, did the lake color ones also made by hands and fingers um, by Wesley? And um, how many of these color finger paintings did uh, Wesley make? Also did uh, Wesley uh, make the pigment by himself? Uh, yeah, did uh, Wesley make pigments by himself or use uh, different uh, mixed media? Uh, um, he used different mixed media. He could be he could be mixing color too, but he didn't actually make the pigment himself. Um, he uh, yes, those um, color uh, color work the latest work those are finger painting. Yes, um, he decided to put color back into in, in, into his black and white painting. So those are actually completed paintings before he put the color on. And I discovered that uh, because he documented by photograph and I kind of recognized. So I was just browsing through one day and I was like, hey, this looks familiar. Hey, 
then I realized that, oh, it is an actual completed beautiful painting before you put the color in. So this, this was how his process was. And he didn't really make many of those because he was at the cups of something new. This was a, a new direction for him. And it, you know, it's really right before he passed away. So there, therefore there are very few of these color landscape paintings. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And oh, anything you want to add on from our oh. speakers? Okay, we have a good question from um, Feng Feng um, to, to Ross. Um, so Ross, you commented that one of Thompson's paintings embedded modernist uh, aesthetics. Could you please elaborate a little bit more? In addition to Chinese traditions uh, and Liu Guosong, do you think Thompson was also inspired by uh, modern art and non-Chinese artists when he was abroad? Um, thank you, Feng Feng. Um, that's a big question too. Um, I'm gonna say, um, I think that Thompson was, as, as Cynthia said, not just working on reevaluating and considering what he could take from Asian or Chinese painting tradition, but he was also aware of other painting um, and other styles of painting. And obviously his interest in Picasso and his cubism is but one uh, very clear piece of evidence of that. Um, so I think that um, this was, this was Wesley was not unique in his interest in thinking about other may, other modes of image making practices, um, and I think he may have also been in part inspired by um, someone like John Gachen, who, as we know, in the late sixties, I think sixty seven or sixty eight, went to New York City, and he found himself in you know this um, American abstract expressionism, well, actually post abstract, well, no, still going on, abstract expressionism and sort of color field painting, especially by um, the artist Helen Frankenthaler. And I think when he saw that that was this kind of painting that was being taken on board as international, as serious, as ambitious painting, he, I think, opened his color palette and made paintings flatter. Um, well, maybe he didn't open his color palette, but he, he, the, the colors become so blue and so very green, as we may have seen in, as, as in, in uh, Rosalind's presentation. I think that Zhang Da Chen provided him with the clue to think about incorporating um, these complicated ideas, formal qualities that, again, may in fact originally belong to Asia, but are being reworked in a European or westernizing or American mode. Um, surface bound and flat, and then they're becoming modern. And so I think he was aware of a lot of trajectories of ways to make images so that he could bring them together to play with them to really come up with something that was his own. I hope that's clear. Um, another question, um, this is from David. Um, can the panel comment on the relationship of Thompson's work in in relation to the tradition of Western modern art, uh, such as his interest with cubism and possibly action painting. Mm. Oh, uh, for some, for, yeah, I couldn't unmute for a bit there. Um, all right. So, I mean, he was definitely fascinated with uh, Picasso and Cubism, and you can see that coming through in his Toronto sketches, right, where he's thinking about um, different dimensions being represented in the, in on the two dimensional um, surface. But again, like uh, what Ross was saying earlier, is that these ideas have existed, you know, since the Northern Song Dynasty or even before that, where um, realism is not what's desired in a painting, um, especially a landscape painting, but more of the capturing of the essence. And you see that coming out, you could almost consider Guo Xi's early spring, which um, Ross spoke about in her presentation as a, a type of early cubist work. You know, we don't have those strict um, uh, geometric planes that are being represented, but he is representing something that is trying to capture the idea of early spring when, you know, you have the dead of winter where everything is, uh, has, be, has been barren, 
right? Because it's very cold. But then when early spring arrives, things are starting to emerge on this, um, on this mountain. Things are coming back to life. And so that's why you have that writhing form right in the middle of his painting um, that is not static at all, right? It, it tries to give you different perspectives of the same mountain or the same mountain face. Um, and in that sense, it's, it's, it could be considered a cubist work where it's trying to capture um, the same object from different directions, right? So as you know, I think Ross made a really excellent point is that Thompson might have been interested in Picasso, but was he also already pulling from things he knew about early Chinese painting and kind of like attracted to those ideas because they must have resonated with him in a way because they were, you know, a bit familiar, you know, using different vocabulary, but probably um, at the core as a very similar concept. Thank you, Rosie. Um... Great. Um, do we have more questions from the audience? You can um, just turn on your um, mic. We can. We have time for maybe another one question. If no questions from the audience. Um, I think it's a good time to share some opportunities. We can see uh, Wesley Council's work in person. So um, the Spiritual Mountains exhibition is still up uh, at um, Berkeley now, uh, and it's closed. Uh, it will close um, on June twelfth. So if you're in the Bay Area uh, or if you're traveling to California, please um, go and uh, see the exhibition. Um, and another opportunity is happening in Hong Kong, um, which is next week um, during Art Basel Hong Kong. Um, Gallery Dumont is presenting works by Wesley Thompson at Booth uh, 1C11. Um, and that's from next Wednesday to next Sunday. So if you're around in Hong Kong, um, please uh, check it out. Um, and maybe my last question um, is to Thingsia. So what's kind of your next plan to um, promote uh, Wesley's work or do you have a goal um, um, in the future? Um, oh, okay. um, I will be continuing what I'm doing. Um, you know, I continue to bring Wesley's work to light and continue to share his work, uh, hopefully in more exhibitions. Um, it is important to me that, um, you know, um, students um, can, um, you know, view Wesley's work and hopefully it, it inspire them, you know, inspire the uh, younger generations of artists. And, um, and hopefully uh, I will continue to be able to uh, show the world, not just in the United States, but other parts of the world as well. So it's something that I would like to do. And also um, be doing uh, more research work on Wesley's to 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 have that done and to work with uh, you know universities and uh, professors um, on that. So this is something that is you know in my planning to do. Um, I think this exhibition, which um, which is a little unexpected, the the spiritual mountain the art of Wesley Thompson, and. Really, you can say that, I mean, I, I really did not set this goal. I, I think this is one goal realized, especially I think for, for, for Wesley's, uh, to be included um, in, in this, um, to be amongst these uh, masters of the Qing dynasties and some of the Ming dynasties and, you know, and the 20th century master, to be included, to be amongst them, uh, you know, Ben P.F.A. really recognized and welcomed Wesley as a master painter, uh, number one. And to be amongst all the masters that he admired and learned from, I think Wesley never would have dreamt that he would have such an exhibition. So I think this is definitely a dream come true for Wesley. Thank so you. I have, yeah, so I have to thank, I have to thank Julie White. Definitely thank you, Julie. Julie White, uh, Ben P.F.A. Uh, you know, for putting on this exhibition. 
And at the same time, I never say my thank you. So thank you, Anchi, for organizing this. Thank you um, Hong, to Hong Kong U, Ben PFA, uh, Christina Yan with this lovely introduction. And thank you um, to Rosaline um, and Ross uh, giving such enlightening um, um, presentations. I definitely have to rewatch this program because I, I, I couldn't absorb everything at once. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Gallery Dumont. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, our speakers, our um, supporters, and also um, um, Bentham Museum, also uh, HKU, Gallery Guma for making this together. So, well, thank you, our audience, for joining today. I think this is the end of our conversation. We will make the recording available in the next few days. Um, yeah. So, good night. And for some, a lot of us in Hong Kong, have a good day here. Okay, bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, thank you. Thank you.